I've explored. And then through two sections, I'm going to ex explain particular aspect of the problem that uh, I've explored. Uh, so the general area uh, of this talk is uh, machine learning. Uh, these days, machine learning has become a, a kind of buzzword you hear that uh, often, even in uh, everyday life newspapers. Uh, the reason is that uh, machine learning has become so popular due to emergence of successful app, uh, applications. You, you have personal assistant robots available to purchase on the market. Amazon kicked up its uh, first drone delivery system recently, and autonomous trucks are being tested at the moment. According to uh, a study by McKinsey Global Institute, by 2030, about 30% of work activities and 60% of current occupations uh, are going to be automated. This is going to be quite consequential. And as a result, we are seeing tremendous interest in the scientific community towards machine learning. Uh, here you can see the number of attendees in major machine learning and AI conferences. And as you can see in the past decade, uh, we see a grow, uh, exponential growth. And uh, uh, it's expected that this trend is going to continue. Now, uh, what is uh, machine learning? Uh, maybe the most common problem in machine learning is uh, supervised learning, in which you assume that um, you have a number of uh, classes, let's say in this example, uh, images of cats and dogs, and you assume that the data points, meaning each image is drawn from a probability distribution, and uh, given a family of parametric functions, you, uh, you try to solve for an optimal parameter such that uh, your expected re uh, risk is uh, minimized. Uh, the way that you, per, uh, to, you solve this problem is uh, through a training uh, data set. You uh, collect a number of data points and the corresponding labels and solve empirical risk minimization problem uh, as uh, an approximation of true risk minimization. And you hope that uh, the model that you've uh, learned is going to generalize well on uh, on, on seeing data. Now, uh, the natural questions that comes uh, here is uh, how many data points do we need to train the model? And then how do we uh, label data points? Because as you can see in this uh, sum, we need to collect uh, a number of data points, th this number n, and uh, intuitively, we expect that uh, if we have uh, more data points, the model is going to be uh, more accurate. This, is, this uh, has been formalized in the probably approximately correct learning paradigm or hack learning, which is, says that uh, given uh, an approximation parameter epsilon, and a, a estimation parameter lambda, you can, uh, and uh, your family of functions, uh, you can find a minimum number of n such that the probability of error uh, is less than uh, your estimation parameter. Now, it's important to note that in, pra in practice, uh, we need to label uh, these number of data points manually. And the way that, uh, that this task is done these days is using um, crowdsourcing pl platforms such as Amazon Turk, you, which means that you use some, uh, you, uh, some uh, people to label data points and then uh, using a paradigm, you aggregate uh, the labels and uh, then uh, you generate your data set. And the moral of the story from this uh, short description is that in uh, current machine learning, learning is mostly feasible if you have sufficient training uh, uh, data, and sufficient number of training data. Now, uh, so 
we conclude that if we have if we choose a suitable family of models uh, which these days are uh, deep neural networks and then uh, we also have uh, the right way to solve the optimization pr parameter and then also we have enough uh, labeled data points then supervised learning uh, is, a, is a solved problem currently. Now the question is uh, what if we don't have uh, uh, the sufficient number of labeled data and uh, what if data labeling is expensive uh, and uh, a slow procedure or even if we have a sufficient number of data points, what happens if the uh, data distribution changes after uh, training the model? And in these situations, uh, the idea is uh, one of the ideas that has been uh, found to be quite effective is to use knowledge transfer from a secondary source of uh, information. And uh, this is kind of similar to humans so when you try to learn something usually you use your experience uh, either from past experiences or uh, uh, using uh, your experiences in another domain for example uh, if you want to uh, perform a, a task in a secondary language let's say you want to write a paper uh, in the beginning, usually you refer to your uh, mother tongue and use your experience in your mother tongue and transfer knowledge from that area. So uh, this is called uh, cross-domain knowledge transfer and uh, to it, it has been formalized uh, in the problem of zero-shot learning, few-shot learning and domain adaptation in uh, machine learning and uh, the idea is that uh, you transfer knowledge from the a domain in which you have sufficient data to the domain in which you don't have uh, sufficient data. Or uh, you may use uh, cross-task knowledge transfer, which means that you assume that uh, you have uh, sufficient data in uh, a number of ta tasks and then you want to transfer the knowledge from those tasks to a task that in which you don't have uh, enough data. So this has been formalized in uh, multitask learning framework in which uh, you, you assume the tasks are being learned simultaneously and also lifeline learning in which you assume that the tasks are being encountered sequentially and you want to uh, transfer knowledge from past experiences to solve the current problem uh, more efficiently. With that being said, uh, I want to talk about a few of uh, my uh, recent research uh, in, in these two areas of cross-domain knowledge transfer and uh, cross-knowledge transfer. The main idea uh, that uh, I, I'm going to use is uh, to transfer knowledge uh, through embedding spaces. Now, uh, I in the beginning, I explained that uh, given a number of data points, we uh, solve uh, 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 for an optimal model. And the idea is that uh, uh, in like, um, not my idea, this is uh, something that is, uh, has been used over and over in machine learning. The idea is that you need to encode your data points. Let's say in this example here, we have a classification problem. And the idea uh, in, in the traditional machine learning is that if you can encode your data points here, let's say the images of zebras, lions, and dogs, such that in uh, an embedding space, uh, the data points that belong to the same cla class lie close by to each other, then it is easy to perform your classification task because similarity is captured in terms of geometric distance and then uh, you can form an optimization problem as soon as you uh, as soon as uh, you have the uh, this case that geometric distance has semantic mean, meaning and then solve for your model and 
Now, the idea that I've explored is kind of extension of this idea. Now, imagine that you have more than one uh, learning problem here uh, in this particular example. Imagine that you have a classification test in the domain of uh, natural images and another classification test in the domain of infrared images. Now, if you can encode these two tasks into uh, a shared embedding space such that relations between data points can be transferred across these two domains, then uh, you may be able to use your knowledge in one of the domains to solve for an optimal uh, in, in the other domain. Now, how you can do this is uh, uh, what I'm going to discuss. So the first uh, particular problem that I've explored is, uh, uh, is how we can use a domain invariant embedding uh, for unsupervised domain adaptation. So if I ask you uh, what are these images or tell me what animals are in these images, probably it is easy for you to say that the left image is uh, images of maybe two dogs and the middle image two cats and uh, the right image uh, is uh, the image of uh, the image of two zebras these are infrared images and humans are not uh, very familiar with infrared images unless maybe you've seen uh, uh, in a movie or uh, um, you've been particularly involved, you don't see these images of often. However, uh, although you don't have much experience regarding these images, you can identify the animals in these images. Why you can do this? This is because in your brain, you are able to kind of map these images to the domain of natural images. And although here you don't have color information, but using informations like texture and uh, edges that are similar to the domain of natural images, you can identify or classify uh, these images. Now, and, um, and uh, note that you, you have done this without using any label. Nobody has ever shown you uh, the images of a dog in the domain of infrared images. And the problem of domain adaptation is similar. Um, you are given a domain in which you don't have labeled data and then you're, but at the same time you have access to another domain in which you have labeled data. And uh, here in this example, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the domain in which we don't have data is domain of infrared images which we call target domain. And uh, the other domain in which we have labeled data is the domain of natural image, uh, images, which we call source domain. And our goal is to transfer knowledge from the target, uh, from the source domain to the target domain. And uh, the idea is uh, kind of inspired by uh, uh, humans, in, which means that we try to connect these two domains uh, through an embedding space. So uh, in this particular example, uh, uh, let's say that we have uh, that uh, in this domain, we have in the domain of natural images, we have fully labeled data. And the idea is, and let's say that you, you have uh, an uh, encoder or a feature extractor such that in the domain of natural images, uh, uh, you can extract features that these uh, data points uh, that belong to a single cl a class like close by in the embedding space. Now, if you can somehow enforce these images in the, the in the domain in the target domain in which you don't have labels data such that the data points lie close by to the um, same class in the source domain. So what I mean is that uh, consider uh, these uh, zebra images in the uh, natural domain. These uh, dark 
uh, dark uh, the, uh, data, uh, data points or representations. And let's say that we are able to embed the data points in the infrared uh, in domain such that the zebra images lie close to the uh, zebra images in the, uh, in the source domain. Then, then if you have a classifier that works well for the source domain, this is going uh, to work well for, for the target domain because you know that from your classifier that these data points in the, uh, in the embedding space uh, are more, most likely to, uh, going to belong to the class of zebra. And of course, this is just a high level uh, motivation. And uh, the way that we implement this idea is that, let's say we have two domain, two domains, source and uh, target domain. The way that we solve, and as I said, in the target domain, we, uh, we assume that we have labels and in the, in, the, sorry, in the source domain, we have labels and it, in the target domains, we don't have labels. And the way that we want to solve classification problem in the label uh, data point is to pass the data point through a shared uh, deep encoder uh, such that in the output of the shared encoder, uh, we minimize the uh, distance between the distribution of, uh, distributions of these two domains. So, which means that uh, we try to solve an optimization problem such that the output of this uh, encoder becomes domain invariant, or in other words, both domains share the same distribution in the output of the uh, encoder. And if we can uh, do this, uh, if we train a classifier only using the label data points from the source domain, then uh, that classifier is going to generalize well in the target domain as well. Uh, more specific, the optimization problem that we, are, we will solve is, uh, it has two terms. The first term is the uh, supervised learning loss, which is the quite uh, uh, common loss that uh, in the beginning, I also explained uh, within that example of cat dog image classification. And the second term is uh, the uh, domain invariant uh, or enforces domain invariance in the output of the shared encoder. We minimize the probability at the distance between probability distributions of the source domain and target domain. And now, of course, the question is, how do we uh, select the proper, proper uh, distribution distance? Now, uh, 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 in, uh, in uh, one of the drawbacks of uh, this initial idea is that if we just uh, minimize the distance between distributions um, uh, without uh, using uh, any class information, what is going to, um, what may occur, that by itself may solve your problem, but it is also possible that you minimize the distance between distributions, but wrong classes match in the embedding space. What I mean is that uh, maybe in this uh, initial example, consider that we minimize the distance between distributions, but what happens is that the zebra class is going to be matched with the lion class in the other domain. Then uh, our model is not going to work. So what we can do is uh, we can um, uh, minimize the distance between the distributions class conditionally, meaning that in addition to using this X as the data point in the target and source domain, we can also use uh, the label information, but um, if you remember, the problem is that we don't have uh, label information in the target domain. That's why we are using, we are trying to solve the problem uh, using uh, knowledge transfer from the source domain. 
what, what we can do is that we can train our model initially on the source domain and then use that uh, model to come up with uh, pseudo labels in the uh, target domain and then use those pseudo labels to, uh, to, um, uh, to minimize the distance between the two distributions uh, class conditionally. And now the, pro uh, the only remaining problem is uh, what is uh, this, this, what is a suitable uh, selection for the, the distribution uh, function? And uh, what we've uh, used is, uh, uh, is uh, the optimal transport or Wasserstein distance. The reason for using Wasserstein distance is that it has uh, non-vanishing uh, gradients when two distributions do not have uh, overlapping support. And this is quite useful in deep learning because uh, in deep learning, we usually use press order optimization methods, which uh, use gradient information. And we also have a theoretical result on uh, why uh, solving that, and that problem, that optimization problem is going to be helpful. And um, to sum up, according to our uh, theorem, uh, uh, the reason that our model is going to generalize uh, uh, well is that the distributions are going to be um, matched class conditionally. Now, we've tested our algorithm on uh, two problems. The first problem is digit classification. So MNIST, USPS, and SVSN are uh, common uh, data sets uh, for digit recognition. And we, uh, we can define uh, these tasks like uh, so um, for example from MNIST to USPS these are uh, domain adaptation problems in which we in, in each problem we assume that uh, we have labeled data in the source domain and unlabeled data points in the target domain and uh, uh, here uh, we provided our results and, and compared against some of the state of the art uh, uh, methods. So, and uh, as you can see in, uh, and we tested our algorithm using uh, three deep net structures, VGG, ResNet, and uh, DRCN, which is a kind of autoencoder. And as we can see, uh, this approach leads to uh, either a state-of-the-art performance or uh, uh, quite competent. The second problem that we have explored is object recognition uh, between the CFAR and SCL data sets. These are uh, 10 class classification problems and uh, we observe similar problems, similar performance in, in this uh, problem. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to move to the second part of talk in which uh, we are going to explore cross-task knowledge transfer. The first problem that I've explored here is uh, zero-shot knowledge transfer uh, in uh, lifelong learning using coupled dictionaries. So, um, uh, I don't know if you have this experience, but even if this particular example uh, does not work uh, for you, I, I think you may have this experience that if you continue to buy uh, a product from the same company, maybe a good a common e example is consider Android phones. Um, uh, when you start to use uh, uh, use uh, an Android phone, maybe in the beginning, um, it, it may take some time for you to know the details. But after a while, even if you ch um, if you change your phone, uh, and even if you have some upgrades uh, in, in your OS, uh, what is going to happen is that you can use your past experiences. Uh, to learn um, uh, that new condition or new, uh, new situation uh, quite uh, fast. The reason uh, is that you can use some high-level knowledge about 
that uh, task and solve uh, that problem um, uh, quite efficiently. This is called uh, zero-shot learning, which means that uh, you don't use, uh, you, you may not have labeled data in a task, but you have some related experiences. And well, so coming back to this uh, idea of uh, uh, using embedding spaces for knowledge transfer, imagine that you have a, a number of tasks that are arriving sequentially, meaning that you learn task one and then you move forward to la and learn task two and so on and so forth. And in addition to data, you have uh, access to um, high level description about that task. Now, uh, if we can embed uh, the optimal uh, model parameter in the embedding space and those uh, high level descriptions such as descriptions such as that given the high level description uh, you can you can kind of map that high level description to the corresponding optimal um, a model then uh, you can learn a task without uh, any data because what happens as soon as you have this high level description here uh, we have denoted high level description with these big uh, yellow circles and uh, if you know how to go from this yellow circle to this red circle, which is the optimal uh, uh, model parameter, then uh, you can uh, solve the problem without uh, uh, using, uh, without requiring any labeled data uh, in a task. So um, um, we have kind of used that intuition and solve the uh, problem of uh, zero shot uh, learning in the uh, in the um, in a lifelong learning setting and uh, so what kind of is similar to what I described lifelong learning meaning it means that we have uh, a number of sequential tasks and then uh, we store our experience or obtain knowledge from past tasks in a repository of knowledge. And then we extract, uh, when we want to solve a task, we use this knowledge uh, that has been obtained from past tasks and then uh, solve for the optimal parameter. And then uh, when we solve the current problem, we uh, kind of add what has been learned from the current task to the repository of knowledge. And as a result, as we learn more and more tasks, because our repository of knowledge or analogously our experience uh, becomes uh, more diverse, we can solve future tasks more efficiently. Now, uh, within this lifelong learning paradigm, paradigm we can also solve uh, the problem of zero sh shot learning. As I explained, the only difference is that we need to learn how to go from the high level descriptions to uh, optimal uh, parameter model or optimal policy to solve that problem. Um, in particular, we have implemented our algorithm in, uh, in a reinforcement learning setting and just uh, in the interest of the time. It means that uh, we try to solve uh, a problem by a trial and error mechanism in which we uh, try uh, a solution and given the feedback that we receive, we kind of try to solve for uh, the optimal model. It is kind of similar to the learning, uh, learning uh, uh, pr uh, procedure in uh, humans. Now the idea that uh, to implement the idea that I explained, we assume that uh, the optimal parameters for those sequential tasks can be represented as sparsely in a dictionary. So which means that just the optimal parameter, you can uh, write it 
in terms of L multiplied by S, where L is shared across all the tasks. And then uh, you try to solve this optimization problem in which you enforce the vector S to be sparse and you solve, uh, you minimize a cost function for your task and your hope is that uh, as you learn more tasks, this dictionary becomes more diverse and kind of um, uh, you uh, um, you encode what you've learned uh, until now in this dictionary. Now, if you solve this problem in, in, in an offline setting, which means that we have all the tasks, we, we are going to have a multitask learning algorithm. Uh, this is called GoMTL algorithm. And if we solve this in a lifeline learning setting, this is called uh, ELA algorithm. Now, in order to extend that uh, framework into into a um, uh, into a zero shot learning setting, we assume that we have a second dictionary uh, D, and these uh, optima uh, sorry these task descriptions, which uh, I've denoted with FMT, can be represented sparsely using this second dictionary. And in order to couple the task parameter, the, uh, the current or for each particular task, in order to couple the uh, optimal parameter and uh, the corresponding high level descriptions, uh, we, in, uh, we enforce that both share the same sparse vector uh, in, uh, in using these two dictionaries. And uh, we solve this optimization problem. Uh, which is kind of similar to the previous problem. The major difference is that uh, we, uh, we, uh, we have added the second term in which uh, uh, we also fit the uh, descriptor, uh, uh, descriptor terms. And uh, as you can see, we use the same sparse vector for any given task. Now, if we can solve this optimization problem, uh, when a task is given in which we don't have labeled data and uh, we have only the high level descriptions, we can use this D dictionary and solve a sparse recovery problem to uh, solve for the sparse vector. And then uh, as soon as we have this S vector, we can multiply that with uh, the dictionary L and then uh, we recover the optimal parameter. And as you can see, we won't uh, need uh, any labeled data points. Uh, we ha also have a theoretical uh, result and uh, which is states that uh, kind of, I try to explain it um, intuitively, which is says that the more tasks that we learn as we expect, uh, the, the better that uh, we can perform a zero shot learning or the more tasks we learn, the ability to learn a task without a data is going to improve. We've tested this algorithm on, uh, on uh, four uh, standard re reinforcement learning, learning tasks, which are the spring mass damper system, cart pole system, bicycle system, and quadrotor system. And uh, we have uh, compared our method, uh, which here uh, is uh, uh, TAD, uh, TAD LL uh, with uh, a baseline, just a policy gradient method, and another method by Sinapop et al, uh, which uh, is another uh, method that uses, uh, li uh, uses knowledge transfer. And also a version of our uh, our algorithm, which we call Paddle, which is uh, just uh, uh, just uh, sorry, Paddle is the uh, the one that we use solve the problem in a lifeline learning sense setting, and Paddle MTL, MTL is the is the one in which uh, we solve it in a in a uh, multitask learning setting. And as you can see, using 
the task descriptions uh, is uh, in, uh, going to improve our performance even uh, even if we uh, we don't want to solve the problem in a zero shot learning uh, system, uh, setting and also uh, in a in zero shot learning setting uh, we can solve the problem without using data uh, from the uh, from the current task the next uh, problem that I'm going to talk about is uh, overcoming catastrophic forgetting using a task coupling uh, embedding space. So one of the uh, good abilities of humans is, uh, is that um, when they learn a task, usually uh, they don't uh, forget what they've learned before, or at least in many situations, when you learn a, thing, uh, a, new, uh, a new thing, at least your recent abilities uh, are not forgotten. This is not the case uh, with current deep learning uh, um, algorithms or deep net structures. If you train a deep net on a number, uh, on a number of sequential tasks here, for example, uh, uh, I've used permuted MNIST, ta MNIST task, which means that uh, just, uh, I think we saw the MNIST data set uh, earlier. It is just uh, a digit recognition data set, like 10 classes of, of digits, single digits. And uh, we can build a, a number of sequential tasks using this digit. And the way that this is done is that you you apply a random permutation across the data set on all data points and permute the digits and as a result you, you are going to have a number of as as much as you want uh, a number of sequential tasks so just the difference between tasks two three and four and five in this particular example is that you view uh, we've used different uh, random permutations to generate those uh, outputs and all of uh, these uh, outputs are generated using this digit five and we do it for all the data points. Now if we try to um, train uh, a deep network on these tasks which means that we train the deep net on the first task and then move to the second task and so on and so forth as expected, when you solve a task, uh, the, this is the training loss. The, tra the training loss decreases for that particular task. But when you look into the um, uh, testing accuracy, well, what happens is that after you learn a new task, you, the performance of the network on, on the past task, uh, tasks uh, uh, starts to decrease and the more you you, uh, you learn the less you learn uh, from previous tasks however uh, as I said humans uh, are much better and they are able uh, to learn new tasks such that uh, what is learned uh, at the moment does not uh, interfere uh, with past tasks now uh, in this uh, work, we've tried to uh, to improve uh, performance of the current deep learning algorithms, but by uh, this idea of uh, using a shared embedding space. And uh, what uh, we've done, in essence, is uh, depicted in this image. Let's say the, uh, for this particular example, we have just binary classification problems. Let's say uh, this is like uh, one of the current tasks. We have two classes. And the way that we avoid catastrophic forgetting is that we, uh, we, in, uh, we enforce all these tasks, share the same distribution in the embedding space. So this is kind of similar to um, the domain adaptation setting that we saw before, but don't forget that here the tasks are 
uh, arriving sequentially. We don't have access to uh, data points of the past task when the current task is learned. But if we learn the current task such that this distribution in the embedding space becomes stable and uh, we don't have uh, much uh, variance uh, across uh, these tasks, then uh, we can uh, then uh, our uh, uh, the obtain knowledge from the past task is not going to be for forgotten because you add your knowledge about this current task uh, such that it is consistent uh, with uh, what has been learned uh, before. Now, uh, prior ideas uh, that ha have been used to address catastrophic forgetting is uh, one of the major ones is uh, replaying samples of past tasks. So when you learn the, the, the current task, you also store the data points of the past task in a memory buffer and you replay them as you learn the current task. And that helps not uh, forgetting the past task. However, the challenge is um, because usually the memory buffer has a limited size, what samples are suitable. And also, uh, as you learn more and more tasks, the size of your um, memory buffer may uh, grow. And, uh, but and then now, the other thing is that um, also, uh, when you try to solve catastrophic forgetting using replay procedure, the tasks are learned independently. What I try to say is that uh, if you have classes that are shared across two tasks, not necessarily they are going to be learned uh, as a single task. Now, in our work, inspired by the complementary learning system theory, uh, we've tried to avoid using a memory buffer by using a generative model to generate pseudo data points that look similar to the data points of the past task and replay them to the model in order to uh, avoid uh, catastrophic forgetting. Now, to implement uh, this idea, we assume that we can uh, decompose a classifier into an encoder and a, a classifier uh, subnetworks. And then we uh, amend the encoder with a decoder. And uh, we denote the output of the encoder or, or the bottleneck of this autoencoder as uh, the shared embedding space and uh, we enforce uh, the task to share the same distribution in the embedding space. Now what we can, how we do this uh, is uh, using kind of is depicted in this uh, block dia diagram. So if you train uh, this network structure over uh, a, a task, and here we assume that we have labeled data across the tasks because uh, this network is going to learn the current task, the data points are going to cluster in the embedding space, which means that in the embedding space, the data points that belong to the same class lie close by and the classes are going to be separated. Now, uh, this means that we can model the data points uh, in the embedding space uh, or representations of the data points in the embedding space by a multimodal distribution. For example, the, the most common multimodal distribution, a Gaussian mixture model, and we can fit uh, a Gaussian mixture model uh, to data representations in the embedding space. And what happens in future, we can use this GMM mo model and draw samples from uh, this GMM and feed those samples into this decoder network. And that is going to generate pseudo data points uh, that represent the past task. And when you learn the current task, you replay those 
pseudo data points along with the uh, current task data. And then uh, um, you also match the distribution of the current task uh, with this uh, GMM in the embedding space. And as, and as a re result, uh, because you are replaying these pseudo samples, you are not going to forget the past task or at least the forgetting effect is going to be mitigated. And at the same time, um, because you learned uh, the current task such that it shares the same distribution in the embedding space, um, interference between the tasks is not going to occur. Now, more specifically, this is the optimization problem that we solve. So uh, we have uh, two um, kind of optimization terms. Uh, one for the current task and for the uh, one for the for the replay pseudo data points and each of those ter uh, those um, uh, ter terms or uh, each of those problems have two terms one uh, empirical supervision loss uh, which is just this uh, information path from encoder to the embedding and then from embedding to the label space and also then uh, we also have reconstruction loss, uh, which uh, we reconstruct the data points. And in the embedding space, we uh, minimize the distance between the distribution of the current uh, task and the, uh, the uh, uh, GMM. And as you can see, this is also similar to uh, uh, this term. I mean, it's similar to the domain adaptation case. But here, uh, don't forget that we are using pseudo data points. And when we solve this problem, the ta and, um, we learn each task consistently uh, with uh, past, uh, past experiences. And uh, as a result, catastrophic forgetting is going to be uh, mitigated. And note that through this process, we don't need any uh, memory buffer, so we don't need to store any samples. And um, again, we have uh, provided a, a theoretical result, which basically kind of, if I want to give you the intu intuitive description, it just tells that uh, as you learn more tasks, uh, you are going to forget uh, more, which is kind of similar to, to humans, kind of you remember the short history much better compared to the long-term history. And if you don't use uh, some of your knowledge often, after a while you, you either forget it or at least uh, you are not uh, as uh, fluent as uh, you used to be. We've tested this uh, paradigm on a permuted MNIST task. And here we have compared it against a uh, full replay, uh, which uh, uh, here uh, we've denoted uh, classification rate versus epochs and each color denotes one task, one of those permutation MNIST tasks. And this, uh, uh, these uh, solid uh, uh, curves denote R algorithm and these uh, dashed curves uh, denotes uh, the full replay. And as you can see, and, and our algorithm as expected is not as good as full replay because the, the pseudo data points are not as good as their uh, real data. However, uh, we are able to mitigate catastrophic forgetting considerably. And as you can see, after five tasks, performance has reduced only by about 10%. Uh, but uh, the interesting thing is that when we look into the embedding space, the full replay is uh, learning it. Uh, these are uh, UMAP uh, visualization of the data points in the embedding space. We see that uh, when we use full replay, uh, the same class is learned as uh, it's a separate cluster in the embedding space. Whereas when we use our method, the same concept is learned uh, across the task. 
we have also uh, tested this algorithm on uh, on the digit recognition tasks uh, where we have used USPS and MNIST tasks and as we, you can see uh, catastrophic forgetting is kind of mitigated here uh, considerably. Now in conclusion um, I want uh, to say that despite uh, remarkable progress in deep learning in, and in machine learning in general. Still, we have a huge room to improve current ML algorithm. Uh, and uh, embedding spaces can be used for transfer knowledge across a wide range of uh, machine learning problems. Here, I just, yeah, because of, uh, in the interest of time, I just talked about uh, a few cases, but this has been explored in uh, many more problems and it has been shown to be an effective method. Uh, also, we can uh, be inspired from neuroscience and psychology um, to draw good intuition how to develop new machine learning algorithms. And uh, finally, lifelong learning ability of humans uh, should be a, a, the major goal for uh, machine learning maybe in the next decade because at the moment we have uh, many good algorithms that, that work well for a single task. However, uh, uh, current uh, machine learning systems are not as good as humans when we add the factor of time and uh, we need to uh, work more and uh, develop AI agents that uh, are able to act sim more similar to humans, can correct themselves, can uh, accumulate uh, experience and solve new, uh, new problems using much less supervision compared uh, to the uh, initial, uh, problem, initial problems. With that being uh, said, I'm happy to accept uh, some new, uh, some questions from the audience. And thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rostami, for your nice presentation. Uh, uh, is there any question? If you have question, you can write in Q&A part, or you can raise your hand to give the voice permission. So, I have, uh, I have uh, one question about the uh, transfer knowledge. Uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, you say that uh, by using uh, an uh, uh, in encoder, uh, we can uh, uh, sh share the knowledge between the uh, label, labeled data and unlabeled data. Uh, actually, uh, is it uh, is it a uh, a kind of classification method, or uh, we use these uh, 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 unlabeled data, we transfer uh, the knowledge uh, 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 of the labeled data to unlabeled data, and then uh, by using the both of uh, these uh, uh, data, we train uh, a classifier and uh, uh, a classi and this classifier used for some uh, classification problem. Which one is true? I think the second one. So the I, so the second in the in the second domain also we want to solve the classification problem, but the issue is we don't have much uh, uh, we don't have uh, labeled data in that domain. But we know that we have some classes, uh, like coming back to that example of infrared images. We have classes, but we don't have labeled data. But and we know that the classes are shared across the domains, meaning that the uh, uh, target and source domains share, uh, share the same uh, classes. And we want to uh, train the model such that uh, in the embedding space, the right classes are matched. And as a result, uh, um, if we train a classifier from the embedding space to the label, they, uh, to the label space using the source domain uh, data, that classifier would work well in the target domain as well. Okay. 
Uh, actually, uh, my question, uh, uh, and thank you for your answer, uh, was so. for um, uh, some uh, fMRI data. Uh, you know, uh, I, I'm a cognitive uh, science student and uh, working with uh, fMRI data and uh, uh, labeling the fMRI data is uh, very expensive uh, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, we have a, a very uh, a little uh, labeled data. And uh, if we can uh, use this method uh, for um, labeling data is very, uh, uh, very interesting for me. And uh, I want to know about, uh, can this method uh, uh, useful for some uh, uh, time series data? Because uh, fMRI data uh, actually have a, a, time, uh, a time dimension in, in, uh, in it. And uh, if we, uh, we can, uh, uh, you, uh, we can uh, involve the data in, the, in this method is very interesting. Well, uh, personally, personally, I don't have much experience with time series, uh, but um, your, ex your example was kind of an excellent example, which means, uh, which you mentioned that we have a domain in which if we have enough time, enough resources, we may be able to label data points, but uh, it's quite expensive. Now, uh, in practice, I think people try either to use unsupervised learning, which means that you don't use any knowledge transfer. And in some cases, it can be, that problem can, uh, can be solved in an unsupervised learning case. But for the case of fMRI, FMR, I'm not uh, familiar with that research area, but let's say that um, you have EEG data and uh, the EEG data uh, and in, in the EEG data, you are able to uh, uh, label your uh, data points somehow. And then you can kind of correspond uh, the FM, fMRI data and EEG by measuring your data, data at the same time. If in that situation, you may be able to use a knowledge transfer. However, I have not worked much uh, in the area of time series. And so I don't know whether this particular uh, method is going to work. But I, I think at least um, what I can tell is that uh, this idea of knowledge transfer is going to be helpful. And I remember, I don't remember the first author, but uh, Jeffrey Hinton has a new RIPS paper, uh, which is uh, like zero shot learning. If you type zero shot learning in Google Scholar, it is one of the most cited papers. And in that paper, uh, they use this idea on FMR, fMRI data, but it is more about uh, classification. And uh, they claim that uh, using fMRI data, they can predict what object the human is uh, thinking about. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They have data and the, yeah. but uh, I, uh, I'm not much familiar with how they process the data. They just use some features in that paper. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Is, uh, if uh, there is, is there any question? Another question? No. So let's to finish this part of the symposium. Thank you very much for joining us uh, today. And uh, uh, thank you for your lecture. And uh, um, goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you for providing this opportunity. And uh, I was really glad to attend. And uh, I'm uh, very glad that you have this symposium. and. Uh, in the future, I will be more than glad if uh, you have uh, other symposiums. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.